Hi there, everybody. Welcome to AWS On Air. I am James Spencer, a Partner Solutions Architect here at AWS. Today, I am joined by Peter Balliet and Niels Bohr from Stone Branch. How are you doing today, guys? Good, James. How are you doing? Good, good. Like I said, I'm up here in sunny Seattle. Uh, awesome. So, Stone Branch, how was uh, how's it, how what is it like? What are we doing today? Well, you know, James, we we have a lot of our customers. Um, we're we're an, an automation platform company, and been around for about twenty years. And a lot of our customers have been using it to integrate into AWS. And so what we thought we would do is kind of give a brief overview of Stone Branch, but really uh, I've got Nils here. Um, he's going to do an actual demo just to kind of give you, give everybody a feel for, you know, how people use our product to automate across what we call kind of the hybrid IT landscape. So you're kind of on-prem systems into AWS and what we typically see customers doing. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I've heard that it's an automation kind of tool and I know automation is a, a big deal. Like whenever you have stuff manually, there's stuff that can go wrong, stuff that's not standardized. Having to pay attention to every little thing, automation is definitely the way to go for yeah, the majority yeah. of things, definitely. Yeah, yeah cool. I, and and I, th I think a lot of automation is um, it's it's taken on a new life ever since cloud service and especially and especially AWS has that automation first, uh, you know, a, approach. And we've seen it be becoming more and more prevalent within companies, and the, the footprint just keeps, you know, keeps expanding. Yeah. Uh, so I have, you have something a little prepared for us. Do you want me to go ahead and yeah. throw it up there for you? Sure. Okay. We've been around about about twenty years and been doing automation that whole time, and you know we've typically deal with enterprise customers. And one thing we're proud of is we've always kind of moved automation forward. It's it's kind of always been there. It's not something new. But it's changed every time there's a there's a technology landscape change, uh, you know, biggest one being being cloud driven by AWS. So um, it's something that we work with very closely with our customers all across the world and, and also our partners to understand how do we need to evolve our platform to take advantage of really all the new technologies and how you automate across all, all of the systems that you have within your company. We kind of, um, uh, you know, we kind of group it into six different areas uh, as and we look, when we look at our platform. And probably the, the first one is event-driven automation. You know, auto automation used to be scheduled, but now it's kind of more event-driven, meaning, um, you know, we get things that trigger automation uh, from outside, whether it be through webhooks or people calling our APIs. We get events within our automation when we're talking to systems or we're monitoring different systems or files, things, it'll trigger automation. So everything in addition to always the traditional scheduling is really being event driven. And then we try to be kind of low code, no code as much as possible. So we've got a drag and drop workflow editor. Uh, we, you know, this kind of goes directly hand in hand with the self-service automation, which we use the term citizen automator meaning you know, everybody is trying to do automation and less and less technical people. So we try to kind of make automation easier to access, e easier to build. Uh, we've got integrations into Teams and Slacks uh, or ServiceNow so that people can use and get access to automation in the tools that they use every day. We also, you know, with, with the footprint ex ex expanding, um, you know, we do analytics and monitoring. So it, it's becoming more part of the critical business processes. So grabbing all that data, making sure everything's working right, driving continuous improvement because you're getting that data off automation um, is something that's becoming very in, you know, important, just like a manufacturing line. Uh, and then we're, we're driving down into so solution specific areas. And so two of the areas that we focus on is infrastructure automation. Um, again, a, a lot of that is on-prem with a lot of the hypervisor platforms but a lot of it is in the cloud and all the services that uh, and infrastructure that you can provision with AWS. And then also data pipelines, you know, just because of all the explosion of data, uh, we see ML ops and data ops really becoming mainstream. And within those, there's always data pipelines that, that have to be automated. And so a lot of the focus that we have is, is how do we do um, automation across data pipelines? And, one of the ways we do that is with in, with integrations. So we we support all of these specific business areas by looking at what tools and systems and services we have to integrate within each of these areas, 
And then we provide that kind of backbone single pane of glass with UAC so that, you know, if you've got automation tools that you need to plug into a broader business process, we, you know, we can integrate to those. But also we, we try to kind of have this common tool where, where you don't want too many automation tools and you want to drive some sort of standardization. And then that, that, that can be, be UAC because we, we can typically do a lot of automation that all these other uh, siloed automation tools do. And um, specifically with AWS, and this is where I'm going to pass it over to Nils, uh, we're, we're going to talk specifically about how do we do all these things with, with AWS. So Nils runs a lot of those areas I just talked about, works across the different business areas where we provide so, solutions for. So uh, Nils, I'm going to pass it on over to you. Yeah. Uh, just yeah, very quick, good. I just... Yeah, so I'm actually... Oh, I was just going to ask a question real quick yeah. for uh, Peter. Sure. Uh, you mentioned event driven versus scheduling that's uh -huh. I, that's great cuz scheduling sometimes things run behind or you might do them too frequently or too often yeah. event driven is perfect because you only do it when you need it and yeah. it's not too late when you know you don't want everything to already be on fire and yeah. then oh well, you know it's scheduled for tomorrow so that's definitely yeah. and great and yeah. you also mentioned um enterprise level and enterprise grade mm -hmm. uh can you speak to that maybe just a touch yeah, I'm, I mean, what what we see is um, is a lot of there's a lot of open source auto automation tools out there, and a lot of decisions are made at a kind of a team level where a uh, a developer or a data engineer says, "Hey, I want to use this automation tool," uh, which is great. But if it's running a critical business process, uh, and a lot of these data pipelines are, are becoming critical business processes, then it's up to IT you know organization to monitor. 7 by 24 365 if, if anything goes wrong that they have to go deal with it and that that per that the person who wrote that is isn't going to be that person so these tools or or the or the platform you use has to be you know enterprise grade meaning that has to support that type of capability and maybe being used by um, a central organization that that's monitoring all the business critical automations okay awesome got it uh, sorry about that to jump in there with there. Uh, Niels, you ready to show us what you got? Yes, yeah, sure. So I'm actually doing the solutions at Stone Branch. And when we talk about um, events, I think that's a good thing to talk about. Then actually event-driven automation is ve actually very easy. Because, um, for example, in Amazon, you have SNS, simple notification services, which can be triggered by a webhook. You know? So we have a webhook receiver, and we can retrieve any kind of SNS message. No? You upload something to a bucket, we receive the message and start the workflow. Uh, same is with SQS. No? So you have this nice message bus. So we have an SQS um, um, monitor, and which is actually also used by our customers. I, I was uh, last week on a project where we actually um, run a um, claims process on a big insurance using SQS as a start trigger. And this is, with, with, I think, with lots of these services no? that you can trigger them event based. Uh, what the challenge for us always is that you have so many services which you need to um, be able to automate. No? Just if you look at the Amazon maps, there are thousands of services. No? So what we have done, we have built into our um, universal agent the Amazon SDK um, framework, in this case for Python. We would also support the Go one, no? but uh, we have the one for Python at the moment. And like this, we can um, add new services that we can use, but also we can use it by ourselves. And once we have created a new um, service, we upload it to our integration hub, and then it's available for all the customers. So in, I would say, 99%, we are building the services for everybody so that they end up in the integration hub. No? Only in very few cases, we do them customer specific. Yeah, what I want to show you now um, today is actually, um, uh, when you see the services there on the right, I want to show you an example where I use some of these services like the Amazon S3, the um, uh, EC2 machines, of course, is important. Um, I will also um, use Glue for the ETL part. I use the Aurora database. So a lot of these things that you see there on the right side, I'm going to use um, in my example, which is actually a data pipeline. Let me now switch awesome. to the to the main screen so that I can explain the business case. Yeah, of course. Um, just go ahead and flip over, and then we'll pop it up yeah. there. There we go. Can you see it already? Okay. Yeah, so yep. the business case I've created for today is a manufacturing company, which produces only one single product. It's the product number four. That's the name of this product. 
Um, and this is produced in lots of, let's say, um, cities all over the world. For example, you can hover over it and then you can see, for example, in this city here, Taran Sinsu, the product for is um, has a sum revenue of $3,600 in this case. And what my use case now is that this company has launched um, during the last months three additional products. And the idea is now to refresh this um, management sales dashboard in an um, event-based fashion. So as soon as a new sales data comes in, this dashboard should be refreshed now with a new product which they launched, actually this product one to three. And then you should see the new dashboard with the new revenue figures um, available in, in here. So my data pipeline, which I've created for this, um, looks like this. So um, it actually collects from all kinds of sources um, uh, data. So when I mean all kinds of sources, it connects data from a, a, a data lake, a third party data lake. Um, then, it trend, uh, then it collects data from a database, in this case, an Amazon cloud database. So I use the Aurora database. Um, I'm also um, getting data from an existing S3 bucket, which I then uh, um, transfer to another data lake. Um, so getting data from the cloud, different cloud storage, cloud databases, and also third party cl um, cloud transfer uh, uh, providers, but also, and this is um, the, um, the one on the top, I will go through in a minute, I collect data from the mainframe. You know, so from an IBM ma mainframe, I get the data and transfer it into an S3 data lake for further analysis. We have lots of insurances and banks, and they still use a lot of the mainframe. You know? um, this is why I think it's important that the customers who still have a mainframe can use these new tools from Amazon. No? So can use the um, Glue, for example, for ETL no? and also Redshift database for that um, to later on show the stuff in the dashboard. So um, actually, I start my data pipeline with a webhook monitor. So I'm monitoring actually um, for SNS messages, which I receive as soon as someone uploads data to a sales bucket. No? So if I upload my data to the S3 bucket called sales data, then this webhook will receive the SNS e um, event um, in real time and will start this uh, workflow. In the workflow, we first then um, stream data from a um, data lake Gen2 to, an, to the S3 data lake. So we try to stream everything to a central data lake. This is basically our central uh, storage, which is an S3 data lake, of course, of course. Then I stream the data which I've uploaded to my sales bucket. I also stream directly to the S3 data lake. When I say stream, this really means we don't need any intermediate storage. So we directly stream from one bucket to another bucket. And the bucket can also be in a different provider. No? Um, so in this case, it's S3 to S3 bucket, but can be also different accounts. Um, this uh, streaming is um, extremely fast. Um, so uh, because we can stream uh, multi-threaded, um, then we extract here data from an um, Amazon cloud database, so Amazon RDS. And this data, I first write down to the file system. So the file system is on an EC2 Windows server. And once it's on the EC2 Windows server, then I transfer it from the EC2 Windows server to the also to the data lake. So this is this task, task here. Then on top, what you see here, this is our mainframe transfer. Before I transfer something from the mainframe to a file transfer gateway, I check if there is enough space. So basically, I'm checking with this task is on my EC2 instance, is the there are 10 gig available on my EC2 instance. If this is not the case, then actually I will automatically start the Terraform workflow, which um, actually will add a new EBS volume to the file transfer server automatically. And then I start the file transfer. So the file transfer is really only executed if there's enough space. Um, then this task transfers the data from the mainframe to the um, EC2 instance in the cloud. Then I do a virus scan. So this is basically a, a real use case, which we have a customer. No? This is why I have this with the virus scan and the file transfer gateway in between. Then actually I move the data from the, um, fr uh, from the EC2 gateway to the cloud um, and, um, yeah, and upload it to the S3 data lake. So at the end, all the files should end up in the S3 data lake. Once it's in the S3 data lake, then actually I ask for a verification. Um, this is I, I just put this in here just to show you how we do the Slack integration. And so I will ask, do you really want now to start the um, Glue ETL process? And if I then uh, verify it with Slack, then I start the ETL Glue process. Um, I will um, crawl the data um, from the S3 and load it into Redshift. This is actually here. And once it's all in Redshift, then I start um, some, some reports on the Redshift database. And I will also refresh uh, um, the Power BI dashboard which has also a connector to Redshift. 
Okay, let me start um, the upload of the sales data. Okay, this is my S3 uh, Explorer. So um, this is basically the sales guy who uploads now his sales data to his sales bucket, which is called sales data PS1. So I upload the file now from my local disk, and it's the sales data two, which I'm going to upload. So it's 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 in CSV format. So now it's uploaded. If you now look at the monitor, so once it's uploaded, the monitor should go automatically to success. So now you see it's in, in the sales browser. And now we receive the SNS message. You see the SNS message was received. We scanned if the SNS message contains really the information I'm looking for, and it does, no? so it went automatically to success. So no polling or something really, all is really um, better. No, I, I was gonna say, Nils, it's, it's, it's a good example of what we mean by uh, event-based automation. You know, you're, that's one of the, the, the ways we typically see it done. Yeah, that, that's good. And and this is something which is also required by the customer. Now, some customers only get once per day a file. Why should I then poll every 60 seconds? No? It makes no sense. No? Um, OK, now what you've seen here, this file transfer task actually said, oh, there's not enough space on the disk. So it automatically started this sub workflow, which is a Terra work form workflow, which adds a new EBS um, device to the um, transfer gateway. Um, uh, we have this nice Terraform task, which actually, first of all, does the init. So it creates the project folder from, for Terraform. Then we run the plan. Um, so a plan Terraform file. So if I open this, this task, it goes very quickly. So then in this task itself, um, I choose actually the action that I want to do. In this case, it's a plan. So basically, I want to try out what will happen if I now add an EBS device, but not will not do it in reality. Then actually, um, uh, to this task, I have my um, Terraform file here assigned. So here you see the Terraform file, uh, which I'm using. It's a very simple one uh, because I'm just adding this EBS device. And um, in the output, so if I go to the output, then you should see that, the, that everything was working. So you see here is my plan result. So everything would be fine if I would run it now. Actually, I'm not running the task now. I'm not doing the apply message because you can believe me, if the plan worked fine, then the um, apply would, of course, also work. Um, this is just one example. Um, another, um, so we, in this case, we store all the um, Terraform files inside the universal controller. We have an, um, version, a, a script library, which is also versioned. But some customers also retrieve the Terraform file from GitLab or GitHub. So that's also supported, also supported, either using the local um, script library or GitLab. OK, what you've seen here, um, uh, the EBS volume was added. File transfer from IBM mainframe to the EC2, uh, to the EC2 uh, machine was successful. Just one last quick thing. So basically, how does it look like? It's all very simple. So this is my mainframe IP. This is the mainframe credential. I want to do a copy. This is a file I'm copying. This is the destination where I'm copying it. In this case, to home, stone, bench, demo, and stone, bench, demo. In this case, it's a uh, machine on Amazon, so an EC2 instance. And I'm just doing transfer type text because it's just a CSV file format. And then on the output, you can see everything what's happened, so that the file was transferred from the mainframe to the cloud. So everything is real. OK, so now um, you see everything is um, uh, received in the data lake, because um, I got the streaming data from S3 to S3, and also from the um, Azure Data Lake Gen 2, the data. And I received it, um, in this case, um, yeah, in the data lake. So let's have a look how it looks like. So this one actually lists the files in my data lake. And you see, here are all the files which I've just received you know, from Amazon, from the database, from the mainframe, from S3, and from uh, the um, uh, third party data lake. Um, what I also got, I should also got received an email. You see it. Please approve the data pipeline for ETL to start. So in this, um, uh, in this uh, report, which I got automatically, um, I list all the tasks which have been happening so far. You know, so just to verify, you see everything is successful. Ah, uh, this looks great. So now what I can do is I can go to my um, I can go to my um, Slack. I should have received a Slack me message on my mobile. No, normally this is of course on the mobile. This so everything looks successful. So I can close this one. Maybe I make it a bit that you can see it more nicely. Yeah. So this is my Slack, and you see there is a Slack message called approve notification. So now I've checked the report. So now I approve this. Normally, of course, I do this via the mobile, but it's a bit hard to see. Um, through the camera, so I just press approve. And as soon as I approve, this Slack task will go to success automatically. This is actually 
yeah, you see it went to success. Of course, we can have also the uh, different other tools like Teams or a service now or whatever. I like Slack actually a lot. Um, so I'm using Slack class for verification. But like this, you can interact with external tools um, with our um, universal automation center. You see now um, the, the Redshift database, uh, I've done some cleanup of the old data and now the glue task start. While the glue task is running, I will show you some other tasks because glue takes some time because it's all real data. So let me quickly show you what kind of possibilities we have to monitor our um, uh, this data pipeline. What you see here is a workflow monitor. But we can also monitor the whole thing in a tree view, so like a table view. So this is the, the pipeline, the workflow. And you see then all the different trees. And, you, and there was one sub workflow, so you can also open the sub workflow here. So everything is a tree view. The other thing is, which people like also, is to have a view where you see the parent and the child. Um, so you always see the predecessor and successor. Remember, there was a Terraform um, uh, workflow um, where I attached the EBS volume. First, I was checking the space that was a predecessor. And once it was successful, then I transfer the data from IBM ZOS to AWS Linux. So you see for each task, the predecessor and successors. Um, so you, then you have the timeline view. So this is where you can see how the tasks are processing over time. No? So this is basically the start of the workflow where I started everything. And these are the tasks which are still due to run. No? Then the last thing I want to show you is the dashboard view. The dashboard view is actually so each customer or each group can create their own dashboards with their own widgets. These are all widgets. And everything can be completely um, created with, uh, with no code. So all these dashboards are just, just click them together. And in this case, I created one for, for the file transfer uh, dashboard. So I have here, for example, the uh, completed tasks um, per, uh, per timeline. Then the failure rate. You see there's nothing failed. Um, the agent status. Then I have the different file transfers, so the progress. And so maybe I go put it a bit here. So this was the stream sales data, S3 to S3 data lake, the, the progress bar. And, um, then the bytes transferred, source, file. And we have also lots of SLA data. So what's the average estimated end time, the lowest estimate end, the highest estimated end time. We can measure the critical path, of course, also in the workflow. So this data is also available. Um, then I have an own dashboard created or on widgets for the mainframe transfers, for the um, AWS Redshift reports, and also for the Power BI once it runs. No, so the Power BI has not yet been started. So the ones we are here is still waiting. Um, like uh, those dashboards, um, you can create as many as you want, and each user group has uh, basically a different focus on these dashboards. Né? So you will see lots of these dashboards depending on what kind of person you are. If you're just a person who monitors the stuff, or if you're just interested in some business data, so you put that's the data that you are interested in. So this was just to show you an example. Um, what's now new in this release, in this version, um, in this uh, upcoming release, is actually that we also provide um, telemetric data. So we, we uh, metrics data. So we can we have an um, open telemetry collector in our product, which then can um, save uh, metrics data in, for example, a Prometheus database. And then you can connect um, a Grafana dashboard to show that um, the dashboard, um, if so in the dashboard, all the data which we um, uh, provide here in an external dashboard. And I've created an, a Grafana dashboard here. Yeah? So this is completely out inside our product, the only thing I'm doing is I'm connecting to the Prometheus database, which is filled by our open telemetry collector. And then I can show similar information that you just saw on the dashboard. I can also um, see in my Grafana dashboard. Né? Like this, your um, monitoring departments can also monitor our, our system, but also the, um, the workflows which we are doing. Né? For example, you have the transfer status per task, the transfers per source, the total uh, transfers per status. Um, then I can uh, have the total revenue, so I can even look in to the output of the files. Now, all this data is provided. Um, it's metrics and also trace data, which we provide to external tools now using open telemetry. Awesome. It's done. You see, the Power BI dashboard is done. So if I go now to the refresh, then, then I'm done. So you just <laughs> go to the refresh. You see, it's successful, the Power BI. So now I should refresh the dashboard. And then I should see that we have now three, three products or four products. Let me check. Now it's ref let's see if the refresh was successful. Ah, yeah, it was working fine. Now you see, now we have three products. So all the data which we retrieved has been sent to Redshift and is refreshed in the data in the dashboards now. Awesome, cool. Uh, yeah, thank you for showing us. I know this big part of this is observability, observability and management. Uh, Peter and Niels, maybe you can touch on that just real quick before we uh, tell give everyone some call to action. Yeah, I, I mean, 
observability is is kind of I think we we hear that word a lot today. And what um, I think where it's coming from is that there's you know applications used to be single stack and and you could just monitor that one application. But you know so with what Nils just showed, you got a lot of different things involved in there, especially a lot of cloud services um, along with with some other systems and. What observability tries to do is, is say, hey, listen, and, and you know, we use the open te open telemetry standards is, is, hey, if everybody can can take data about how their application is performing and what's going on and exports it in a standard way, then you can have common collectors, you know, and application performance monitoring tools or APM tools are, are kind of, you know, some of those type of tools that can collect all of this data. And then you know you can build common dashboards, common analytics, based on the data from from our system, but then also from any other system that can emit the d data from it. So it's why it's becoming so important in in these systems that span a bunch of you know cloud services. Cool, awesome, great. So uh, I guess before we sign off here, real quick, so we can see ourselves, uh, where can we go to learn more or sign up or yeah. can we connect with you or <clears throat> yeah, where sure. do we get yeah, you can you can connect with me um or you can go to our website at stonebranch.com and we've got a got a, a lot of great material on what we just talked about there's some videos up there to kind of dive deeper in some of those solution areas that you know that we talked about cool awesome well thank you peter and niels and thank you for showing us the stone branch universal automation center and uh thank you for joining us on aws on air and we'll turn us back over to the regularly scheduled program. Thank you. Thanks, See thanks. you guys. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot.